We are a Yukon-focused silver explorer. We are exploring right now in the advanced district in the Kino Hill, famous historic silver district. It's an exciting time for the company. Our project is located in the central Yukon. We're right on the highway. We've got grid power and we're next to Alexco, who's been operating in the district for years. So it's a great place to be working. The Yukon's one of the preferred jurisdictions, I think, right now globally for exploration. Um, great workforce, great environment. We have put together a land package now that's 166 square kilometers in the Kino Hill District. The district's produced over 200 million ounces of high-grade silver over the last 100 years, discovered after the Klondike, so it's got this fabulous history. It's a kind of a fun fact. There's more value in silver that came out of the Kino Hill Silver District than all the gold in the Klondike. So it really is a world-class district. It's a great place to be exploring. So it's a great team. We've come together because we want to work on an exciting project. We're excited about being on a project that's a discovery stage opportunity where we can add ounces and create value for shareholders. And we are one of the largest shareholders ourselves. Management collectively owns 25% of the company. Our core expertise is exploration. That's what we've done well, is make discoveries, advance deposits, and grow those for shareholders. And that's where we want to stay focused. You've got 200 million ounces of historic production. You've got almost 100 million ounces of new resources. We're on the eastern half of the district. Geologically, there's a possibility here that we could find just as much as has been found on the other side of the district. And in many of the biggest silver camps globally, they've produced over a billion ounces. The deposits to date are all quite shallow by high-grade vein standards at Kino, most of them less than 300 meters from surface. You know, in some places they're mining thousands of meters depth. So I think this is a camp that has a huge forward-going history in terms of new discoveries, and we're one of the groups that's going to be out there making those, hopefully. Our team has between 20 and 30 years experience for the majors, for the mid-sized explorers and developers. They've been there, they found major discoveries in the region. Uh, you know, our team is credited with the, the huge Donlin Creek discovery in Alaska, the Galore Creek uh, deposit, copper gold in BC, well green expansion in, in, in the area. So we bring a track record of discovery success to the table. We've chosen to work together because we've worked together in the past. And I think that's something that eventually will pay off for our shareholders and investors as well. Welcome to Proven Improbable. I'm your host, Maurice Jackson. Joining us today is Greg Johnson. He is the president, CEO, and director of Metallic Minerals, which is known for high-grade silver in Canada's Yukon Territory. Mr. Johnson, welcome to the show, sir. Well, thank you for having us. We are honored to have you on our show, sir. For the audience, today's interview will be the first of a three-part series introducing the value proposition for the Metallic group of companies comprising metallic minerals, group 10 metals, and granite creek. These are three separate leading exploration companies, each with a different metal of focus, but with a common approach to business under the proven management of the metallic group. Today, we will focus on metallic minerals, a leading explorer of high-grade silver in the Yukon Territory. Mr. Johnson, for someone new to the story, who is metallic minerals, what is your flagship project and what is the thesis you're attempting to prove? Yeah, well, Metallic Minerals is a leading explorer for high-grade silver, uh, and we are exploring in the Kino Hill Silver District of Canada's Yukon Territory. Uh, this famous silver district is one of the highest-grade silver producers in the world, producing over 200 million ounces of past production and 100 million ounces of current resources. Over the past two years, uh, Metallic Minerals has consolidated the district alongside our neighbor Alexco Resources, and we are undertaking exploration along the extensions of the known productive structures that continue onto our, our land holdings. 
Um, we believe that the Makino Hill Silver District has the potential to be a billion ounce plus silver district. And geologically is very similar to the Coeur d'Alene District in Idaho, which has produced over 2 billion ounces of silver from very similar style of veins. Please share where in the Yukon the Kino Silver Project is located and provide us with some historical context. Yeah, so the, the Kino Silver Project is located in the central part of the Yukon, almost right in the middle, and was discovered after the famous Klondike Gold Rush that many of your listeners are, are probably aware of. Uh, with dozens of producing mines developed uh, over the years, uh, since the 1920s to, to the present. Um, Metallic Minerals has consolidated uh, what was previously a very patchwork land ownership. There were only four, 40 different owners in the district, uh, and we brought that together. So it's largely uh, Alexco and ourselves. And our ground hosts eight past producing high-grade mines on it, uh, giving us an excellent exploration potential. Exploration of the Kino District over the past few years um, has seen some major new discoveries, including the Birmingham Silver Deposit by Alexco, uh, which is probably one of the best new silver discoveries really in the industry by, by grade and quality. And it really demonstrates the remaining potential in this proven high-grade district for, for new discoveries. Mr. Johnson, we've covered some good background on the Kino Silver Project. Walk us through the project. Yeah, I think uh, maybe uh, a good way to start is is taking a look at, at a map of the, the lower part of the Yukon. Um, you can see uh, on this map, uh, the Kino district is, is right in the middle. It's located right on the highway. Uh, there's grid power uh, here in, in the region with a mill uh, and, and operating uh, mines by Alexco. The road continues down through Whitehorse, which is the capital uh, of, of the Yukon and down to existing port facilities um, in Skagway, Alaska. So really all the infrastructure uh, that's needed to build a mine is, is here and present uh, in, in the Kino District. And this uh, project also sits within the traditional territory of the Nacho Nayak Dun First Nation, who have comprehensive uh, uh, cooperation benefits agreements in place with both Alexco and some of the other most advanced uh, projects in the region. So it's really an, an excellent place uh, for us to be exploring. If we zoom down a bit and take a look at a regional map right around the district, uh, what you'll see uh, in this image is uh, the, this, the electrical holdings in the light green. Uh, you'll see the metallic mineral holdings in the kind of golden brown color. Uh, that really forms the core part of the Kino Hill Silver District where these high grade silver veins occur. And then within the region, there are additional players who uh, some of your listeners may be familiar with, such as Victoria Gold, who's developing a large open pit mine that's currently in, under construction. And to the north, uh, ATAC Resources, who's partnered with Barrick Gold on their Rao Trend property, which is adjacent to our McKay Hill project, which is another high grade silver project that we'll talk about uh, a, bit, a bit later. Um, you can see the roads, you can see the access uh, into the area. Uh, Kino City and the mill for the district sits right in the center of the district. So it gives us road accessibility to the entire property and will really facilitate uh, development of uh, any of these resources in the future. Kino district was, uh, production was restarted in 2010 uh, by Alexco Resources. In this next uh, image, you'll see uh, the, the mill that was built in 2010 uh, that sits uh, right near Kino City. Um, you'll see that uh, at an average grade between 840 and 930 grams per ton for the current mine plan for Kino Hill, this is the highest grade and class of, of any silver mine uh, in out there. And at three and a half to four million ounces, this would make this a top 10 silver producer in terms of uh, production levels. You'll notice on this chart that the, the capex is quite low at $27 million uh, with really an exceptional IRR. And that's because these deposits are still quite shallow with the deepest mine in the district at 300 meters of depth. Uh, these, these deposits are very high grades so with a relatively low tonnage. Uh, and near surface, which makes it so that you can have some very attractive low capital uh, investment uh, to bring these uh, to production. Uh, if we take a look at grade of the Kino district versus grade of the other primary silver mines uh, in the industry, 
Uh, this chart compares uh, the measured and indicated or proven and probable resource uh, mine grades of those various projects. What you'll see on this chart uh, is it's showing the component of silver, gold, uh, lead, and zinc. Uh, and you can see there's a, on the far right, there's a number of relatively low grade, mostly open pit mines. And there's a large group of mostly underground, medium grade deposits. And then there's really six silver mines that truly stand out in terms of their grade. Uh, Kino Hill uh, is the second highest total grade and the highest in terms of silver grade with the new mine plan uh, of any of those deposits. And what also stands out in this comparison is that located in Canada, um, it's one of the few uh, Canadian silver projects. And likewise, it's one of the lowest political risk um, not being in either China, Argentina, Bolivia, or, or Mexico, Guatemala, uh, where some of these other projects are, are located. Um, the style of deposit uh, and the style of the veining that we see uh, at Kino, these occur as high sulfide, uh, silver, lead, zinc uh, veins. These are structures that, that form in the key host rocks, such as the Kino Hill Quartzite. And what you can see in this image as you can see, the, the high-grade nature of these deposits. This is underground at the Belkino mine. You can see uh, there on the lower left uh, a one-meter um, bar for, for relative scale. So this is about a five-meter zone. So this is fairly typical of the mineralization that you would see um, in the Kino district. Uh, the bright, uh, silvery-looking material is, is silver-rich galena. Um, some of the, the brown-colored material will be sphalerite, which is a zinc uh, mineral. <clears throat> and then you've got quartz and carbonate forming the, the rest. And truly, this is a what we call a structurally hosted deposit. So the key for our geologists is to understand where the structures are. Uh, this tabular zone would continue to the, towards the surface, and it would continue at depth, pinching and swelling in terms of the overall width. Uh, but this really gives you a sense of these very high-grade uh, silver veins in the Kino district which can run over 5,000 grams per ton, which is just truly a, a staggering grade. Um, if we take a look at uh, a geologic map of the Kino Hill District, um, what you can see here in this image uh, is the entire district from Silver King on the west to Cobalt Hill on the east. That measures a total of about 35 kilometers from end to end, and these Lines along, uh, you can see on the geology, uh, indicate the, the 12 known mineralized structural trends. And what you'll see in orange are the past producing mines, and you can see how these occur uh, along those major trends as almost pearls on a string. Uh, you can see in yellow the recent new discoveries in the district, uh, which highlight some of the new mines going into production. And the small red circles represent high-grade past producers that occur on the metallic mineral holdings. Our lands are dominantly to the east in the lesser explored part of the district, but also continue to the south and west and in places are turn internal to the electrical holdings uh, where we've been able to acquire key blocks of, of ground that have past producers and are open at depth in terms of potential uh, resource development. What uh, would be uh, useful here Next is to just give an indication of what the, the third dimension uh, looks like when we are exploring as geologists uh, for these deposits. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at what's called a cross section. And on this map, you can see a line right through the center that goes east to west, A to A prime on the image. And what that's gonna do is allow us to look at a slice through the geology. The geology here is relatively flat lying, uh, gently dipping uh, to the south. So it's kind of a stacked package of metamorphosed sedimentary rocks. And this area was subjected to strain in the past when these deposits were being formed approximately 80 million years ago uh, that caused these deep-seated cracks to form. And that's where these vein deposits that are being mined and we're continuing to explore form. So if we take a look at this cross-section uh, east to west now, looking at the geology through a slice, what you can see are these areas uh, which are shown in this case as an ellipse uh, with a stippled red pattern represent these ore shoots, and they tend to form in the, the pink unit here, which is a very brittle 
quartzite host rock, almost pure quartz. So it's very brittle, and it's an excellent host uh, for these structures to form and be uh, really uh, develop into these high-grade ore shoots that make up these uh, kenotype deposits. It's believed that underneath the Keno district, we had metal-rich intrusion bodies, uh, intrusive bodies that effectively uh, were the source of the fluids that uh, drove these metals and these vein deposits. And as you can see, as you move from, from really uh, west to east, uh, based on the amount of exploration that we've seen in the district, the Birmingham trend being the most uh, developed with 160 million ounces, the Elsa and the Husky trends to the west with about 35 million ounces each being lesser explored. Uh, and then as we continue to the east, uh, you've got the Flame and Moth deposit, which is a new discovery in the district with about 50 million ounces, and then Belkino at about 25. And the other areas were, were previously privately owned, very fragmented land ownership uh, that did not see modern exploration. And those have been subsequently uh, consolidated under metallic minerals. And those are the areas with the same style of geology that we see on the western side of the district where the past production has been made. Uh, that we are now exploring uh, in our, our overall process uh, on the Kino Silver project. Taking a look now at a section along the vein uh, on the Birmingham trend, which is the most well-explored trend in the district, uh, what you'll see is looking in the, the plane of the vein, we get a sense of the types of, of geologic settings and the types of deposits they form. Um, in the center of the district, the Hector Calumet mines, these historic producers produced over 100 million ounces, uh, the largest single producer in the district at very, very high grades, uh, in excess of 1,000 grams per ton of silver. Uh, Alexco, over the last few years, was exploring along this major structural trend in that same quartzite unit shown here in the pink color. Uh, underneath an area of past production, uh, relatively modest past production, uh, they started drilling along that trend and discovered the Birmingham deposit. Um, that deposit has now grown into uh, some 50 million ounces. It still remains open at depth and has the potential to become perhaps even the largest deposit in the district. As an exploration geologist, you, know, you get quite excited when a deposit of this quality, uh, this grade and size, is being found right near surface and only a kilometer uh, from the largest producer in the district. This is a strong indication that this is a district that has excellent potential for new discoveries uh, as we continue to explore along these trends. As we continue over to the east uh, from the Hector Calumet, you start to get out of the quartzite hosted vein systems and into the greenstone hosted vein systems. Again, this was a brittle rock that as these structures developed, uh, formed an excellent setting for developing high-grade ore bodies, and the Sadie Ledoux is an example of a greenstone hosted. So these styles of deposits are the same styles that metallic minerals is, are looking at in, on our ground. Uh, we have ground that is to the east and west of the Birmingham trend, uh, and so far to date, um, our process has been one of compilation of, of key ground uh, to be able to put the, the land package together, prioritizing among uh, various targets to pick the, the ones that we had, uh, the feeling that we could advance the most rapidly towards resource development. And we've kind of broken these into uh, key baskets, if you will, uh, based on the priorities of these targets. We have three targets that are currently um, developing resources. So that means we have high-grade mineralization at surface, uh, we've got trenching, we've got shallow drill holes that indicate we have a mineralized system that's similar to the same setting as was seen at the Birmingham. And we're now drilling along that structure to determine how large a resource uh, we can develop. And we have three targets at that stage, the Caribou, Homestake, and Formo deposits. In addition to that, we have six other targets where we have ore grade mineralization at surface and trenching and sampling, but these have not yet been drill tested. And these targets are, are really now, uh, we refined the targets enough that we're ready to go in and drill test them with the first hole. So we'll probably drill four to six holes in these targets, looking to determine whether or not these have potential to become large uh, vein systems, uh, similar to what we see in other parts of the district. 
In addition, we've got about 20 earlier stage uh, targets where we are developing and refining uh, our understanding uh, of the system uh, through tools such as uh, geophysics and soil sampling, trenching and mapping. And these will be targets that we'll be looking to advance through a drill targeting stage. So coming uh, out of this program in 2018, uh, we're quite excited to uh, be continuing our work, refining the targets that we're, we're drilling and getting these initial step out drill tests completed on some of these already identified target areas, such as uh, the three uh, that we, we mentioned. Mr. Johnson, you've demonstrated that Metallic Minerals is exploring high-grade silver in a world-class district. Compare and contrast how shallow your deposits are compared to similar districts like the Coeur d'Alene District in Idaho, which was the start of many of the best known silver miners like Core and Hecla. Yeah, this is an excellent point, uh, Maurice. Uh, when we look at the Kino District, uh, it is very comparable in terms of style geologically with Coeur d'Alene. But in the Kino District, the deepest mine uh, in terms of mining depth is only to about 300 meters from surface. Uh, the deepest drilling is in the new uh, Birmingham Discovery at 400 meters of depth. By contrast, the Coeur d'Alene District, where they've recently completed a, a new shaft to three kilometers of depth and have produced over two billion ounces of silver, you really can see how the potential at the Kino District um, is excellent for us to continue to explore along trend and depth and to really grow this district beyond uh, the, the 200 million ounces of past production and current 100 million ounces of, of total resources. The Kino Silver Project is considered a large brownfields exploration property. For the members of the audience that may not be familiar with the term brownfields, please explain why this should matter to them. Uh, a brownfields exploration uh, property is a term that we use when you are uh, exploring in an area that's had significant past production um, and discoveries. And many people may not realize that the majority of the exploration uh, dollars that are spent each year in the mining industry actually go to exploration in and around existing mines because it's one of the best places to make discoveries um, that can be rapidly developed and produced using the existing infrastructure in the area. Uh, the adage in the mining industry is the best place to find a mine is right next to an existing one. In this case, in the Kino District, uh, we've consolidated uh, a land holding alongside an existing mine operator, Alexco Resources, and are exploring on those same productive geologic structures, dramatically increasing the probability of exploration success and making new discoveries, and potentially allowing us to utilize that existing infrastructure for rapid development, for low capital cost mines uh, that can be developed because they're near surface and have the benefit of the existing roads, power and infrastructure that's already in the district. Metallic Minerals has another silver property in your portfolio, McKay Hill. Where is it located from the Keno Hill project? And please provide us with some historic background. So the McKay Hill property is, a, is a, an earlier stage property, but it's an opportunity that we see uh, for another potentially district scale, uh, high grade silver uh, property similar to, to Keno. Uh, it's about 50 kilometers to the north, uh, up near uh, ATAC Resources ground. Uh, it was historically a high-grade producer back in the 30s and the 40s. Um, and what our work over the last couple of years has shown is that we've got a, a large number of veins in the area, uh, that these come right to surface, uh, and that with the sampling that's been done to date, uh, we see the opportunity to develop a, a second uh, silver project with significant uh, potential. Uh, here. We completed uh, a work program in parallel to our Kino, Kino Silver program this year on the property uh, and we're expecting to be able to uh, release results from that uh, very shortly. How has the work gone this year at McKay Hill? Well, it's been an exciting year this year. This is a follow-up year from last year's program where we did initial sampling and in, in some of the, the known historic prospects. Uh, this year our work expanded out across the property using geophysics, geochemistry, and, and other tools. We basically came in and, and did additional work in other areas and expanded the known zones that we were looking at. What was exciting is that we had several new vein discoveries uh, that we uncovered. We expanded the size of the historic central zone, uh, now approximating 
um, something you know, up to a kilometer in length and 250 meters in width. And so it really looks like we've got the potential for something that's coming together as a bulk mineable target, as well as a number of other high grade uh, vein occurrences on the property that, that really justify additional work. Uh, the results that we received last year um, showed similar types of mineralization to Kino uh, with silver equivalent values over 1,000 grams per ton, uh, and sometimes gold values exceeding 10 or more grams per ton in some select samples. This is, again, a polymetallic system, so it's silver, lead, zinc, copper and gold uh, in some of the things. So it's, a, it's an exciting opportunity, earlier stage, but this is uh, indicating that this region uh, shows excellent potential for creating value uh, as we continue to explore and advance uh, this portfolio of projects. All right, sir. Now you're wrapping up exploration for this season at the Kino Silver and McKay Hill Silver Projects. So when should we expect to see the next results from this year's drilling and target development work? Yeah, so much like last year, uh, we would anticipate uh, being able to release uh, results here over the next couple of months. Uh, last year, based on, on putting those numbers out, we saw quite a good response uh, in, the, in the market uh, from those results as we've continued to advance and highlight the potential on the property. So we, we've got, a, a, um, I think, an exciting period of news ahead for the company. Uh, and we look forward to being able to lay out those results and really uh, indicate this, the potential, the number of targets we've got, and the opportunity going forward on these properties. Lastly, Metallic Minerals is also building a portfolio of alluvial gold production royalties in the Klondike Gold District. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so this is this has been kind of a fun new opportunity. Um, last year, we had a chance to pick up a large block of, of ground in the Klondike Gold District. Uh, you know, the historic um, gold rush area uh, where alluvial productions of gold and gravels was found in the 1890s. And since that time, what many people may not realize, uh, you know, production of gold has continued uh, in the region. Um, in the period of the 1960s and 70s, up through the 1960s and 70s, uh, we saw dredging with these large uh, bucket line dredges uh, in the major streams and drainages. And there's been about 20 million ounces of, of gold uh, produced uh, historically in the, in the, deep, in the region. Um, the Indian River drainages are now the single largest producer in the Klondike district, producing about half of all the gold in the Yukon. And Metallic Minerals has been able to acquire a large block of land in this area with the opportunity to be able to invite uh, experienced operators, placer mining operators, in to option this ground uh, for production to us on a gold royalty basis, where we receive a 10 to 15% uh, royalty on production. Um, this has been something that's been uh, building over the last couple of years. We've already had uh, two options completed last year. We received some initial royalties from test mining. And with uh, completion of additional leases this year, we have some 27 miles under lease. Uh, with exploration activities happening this year, again, we were paid uh, some additional royalties on production. And so we see this as an opportunity to start to build uh, a, a production business, uh, though modest to start with, that over time we think could be fairly substantial uh, for the company and could allow us to have sustainability and cash flow uh, while we continue to focus on our exploration as one of the leading silver explorers in the Yukon. In particular, the opportunity on Australia Creek uh, is an interesting one. Uh, this area was not historically mined, even though the streams here are, are gold bearing, because it was the area that had the water retainment dams that were used for the bucket line dredges uh, that were producing in the lower Indian River and Dominion Creek. Uh, those dams were removed uh, in the 1980s. And so Metallic has been able to pick up the entire uh, Australia Creek drainage system um, under claims. And this area has, is one of the few areas in the region where real land packages of scale uh, can be uh, developed. Uh, with these initial leases we've signed on the lower part uh, of Australia Creek, uh, this gives us the ability to put in infrastructure and then allows us to invite additional high quality operators to come in on the upper parts of the stream. We're currently in the permitting process on three different operating areas. 
Uh, so we'll have the potential for another 10 operators uh, here uh, in the next year or two. And we're in discussions currently with a number of parties who are interested in acquiring ground in this highly prospective uh, area. So it, it's an exciting development for the company. Uh, and I think it has the opportunity to provide uh, sustainability and potential cash flow for the company going into the next couple of years as we continue to focus um, on being one of the leading silver explorers on a hard rock exploration basis uh, in this promising uh, Yukon Silver District. Mr. Johnson, I am quite impressed with the 10 to 15 production royalty that uh, you're receiving here. Share with us, how are you able to accomplish this? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a point that's worth noting. Uh, in the hard rock uh, mining business, royalties are often one, two, three percent. Uh, and that's really the, the difference here is that because this is gold and gravel, uh, the cost both to, to run your mine in terms of the equipment and the, uh, the operating cost and the capital for your processing plant is much, much lower. So you aren't investing hundreds of or even billion, hundreds of millions or even billions of dollars to build a mine of this type. You're looking at tens of millions of dollars in equipment and operating costs. So they can afford to pay a much higher royalty because there's not as much capital investment. Uh, in addition, they can get going in terms of permitting and operations. We can often permit one of these projects in six months as compared to years for hard rock deposits. So that, that allows the opportunity for both a higher, higher royalty and a faster pathway to production on these in comparison with a royalty for a hard rock deposit. You know, this really speaks to the business acumen of metallic minerals. Uh, what is management's philosophy? Are you looking to build mines or are you focused on exploration? Well, on the silver side of the business, we're very much focused on uh, the opportunity uh, to make discoveries uh, and to rapidly advance those to resource definition. Uh, we, we think that one of the you know greatest points for value creation um, in, in the industry is that early opportunity as an investor to participate in discovery and development of resources. Um, it's not uncommon that the value that's created in that initial discovery and resource development phase uh, may not be exceeded again until these projects actually go into production, oftentimes many years later. And so that's really the focus. This is a team uh, that's been you know, serially successful in terms of finding large deposits. Uh, and developing those and advancing those. And we really see that as the opportunity for our investors to participate in that. On the alluvial business, <clears throat> what we are really focusing on is doing those things we do well, uh, acquiring large land packages, getting them into a permanent phase, and then inviting experienced operators to come in and pay us on a royalty basis. Um, so it's really a combination of process uh, and opportunity with metallic minerals. Switching gears, I learned from Rick Rule and Doug Casey that the people running the business are equally, if not more important, than the latent material on the ground. Mr. Johnson, please introduce us to your board of directors and the management team, and what unique skill sets do they bring to Metallic Minerals? Yeah, I think this is really uh, an exceptional group of explorationists. Uh, we've worked together in the past with, with other companies. Um, many of us worked with uh, the well-known uh, large producers such as Barrick Gold and others, and were key parts of leading explorer developers such as Nova Gold, Trilogy Metals, Well Green, Northern, Free Gold. Uh, and this is a group that has been credited and awarded um, awards uh, for their discovery and advancement of some of the largest deposits in North America, uh, including the Donlin Creek gold deposit in Alaska, now over 40 million ounces of reserves, uh, the large Galore Creek copper gold silver uh, deposit in British Columbia, and the Well Green uh, platinum uh, nickel copper deposit in, in Yukon. This is also a group uh, that has been involved in permitting mines in, in Yukon, and has been recognized for its environmental uh, stewardship and our approach uh, to, to business. So it, it's, it's, it's unusual in a bit uh, to see the depth of experience that we have in this team with many people having 20, 30 years or more experience in the industry. But in this current uh, challenging marketplace, I think it really was an opportunity for a great group of people uh, who'd worked together in the past to be able to work on some truly exciting projects where they saw the potential to create value, to be an equity shareholder, 
and to really, really have some fun and, and work on some really exciting projects. Let's talk about the stock. Uh, tell us about your share structure, options, warrants, and cash position. Yeah, so the company is a relatively new company, uh, founded in middle of 2016. Uh, we've got 61 million shares outstanding uh, with options and warrants. It's about 87 million fully diluted. Uh, current market capitalization is approximately uh, $15 million. Um, and we've got about uh, $1.3 million in cash. And we've got about $1.8 million in callable uh, warrants uh, that are deep in, in the money. Um, so we've got a good tight share structure. Uh, we've got um, probably trading something on the order of about 1 to 2 million shares a month on a relative trading uh, basis. Um, you, you will see that the metallic minerals has held up well against both the silver ETF as well as the GDXJ, the junior miners, miners ETF. And I think that's largely because uh, our shareholders recognize the long-term value uh, in the Kino Silver District. They recognize the opportunity to participate in that value creation process. And so uh, we're a little less volatile uh, than, than our, our peers. Uh, if you look at the benchmark junior ETF, uh, and I think that we've been able to demonstrate uh, value creation despite a very challenging market uh, through the results we've had to date and look forward to continuing to deliver on those kind of results. How much debt do you have? Uh, we're fortunate that at this point we're, we're debt free. Um, and with that opportunity on the warrants, uh, we've got the ability to call those, those funds in as, as needed. Um, which you know, can, can aid us. In addition, if we can build on that alluvial uh, royalty business, that can be an opportunity to bring in cash flow that could help cover some of our ongoing operating costs uh, and reduce the amount of, of uh, share issuance needed to sustain the company. What was your budget this year on Keno Silver and McKay Hill? So uh, again, the same as last year, we spent about $2 million at Keno silver and about 500,000 at McKay uh, to be able to at McKay advance uh, towards a drill targeting uh, stage uh, with with targets that are should be drill ready for 2019 and at Kino a combination of target development and refinement and drill testing at the three most advanced uh, targets uh, on the property where we've done um, uh, step out drilling uh, to continue to understand the scale and potential of those opportunities. Tell us about your burn rate. So our burn rate is quite modest. Uh, one of the opportunities with uh, the metallic group of companies is that we're sharing uh, an admin team, office space. We're really focused on keeping costs low in terms of running the company, being able to focus money in the ground. We're probably running at about $50,000 a month, including our technical team to run the company, and we've got some opportunities to reduce those those numbers even further. Uh, this is really all about you know trying to focus funds on doing value creating activities, um, and that's really money in the ground and money at the drill bit. Do you have institutional investors at this point? Yeah, so even though we're a relatively newer company, we do have a, a, um, several mining focused institutional funds. We've got one group out of uh, Europe already and two out of Toronto, um, making up about 11% of the shareholders. And then we've got about 30% of the shares held by high net worth individuals and management and board is, is one of the largest holding groups at 25%. What is the float? Yeah, so probably looking about 30 million shares, maybe less is, is the actual available stock that's out there and trading. Uh, most of particularly uh, the high net worth individuals are long term, and I don't think that that many of those shares are out there and available for trading. Uh, and as, as I mentioned, you know, we probably we have pretty good liquidity for a, a smaller company in the sense that we're trading a, a couple of million shares a month on most months. All right, sir. You survived the storm. Mr. Johnson, multi-layered question here. What is the next unanswered question for Metallic Minerals? When can we expect results? and what will determine success? So the next few months should be an exciting period um, uh, for the company. We're expecting news results from both McKay Hill and Kino Silver uh, coming out of the next couple of months, uh, similar to last year. And we're, we're hopeful for a, a similar type of, of market response as we're delivering and progressing uh, those projects. 
In addition, with the expansion of the resource at Birmingham that was announced recently by Alexco and with them advancing that into production very shortly, that should draw attention, I think, to the district uh, over the next six months and should be a po positive catalyst for metallic minerals. The King of Silver project uh, really is a is an ongoing opportunity for value creation. It's a very large uh, land package. Uh, in 2019, we'll have nine targets that are uh, drill ready for potentially testing, including the three that are at the early resource delineation stage. And we've got another 20 targets that we're advancing towards drill testing. So we've got lots of areas uh, for potential discovery and lots of areas uh, to continue to advance and develop and, and really believe uh, there's the opportunity to create significant resources on the eastern and southern parts of the district. Um, this is a property that's got a very long history of discovery and production and will continue to be focused on building out that value for our shareholders. Uh, we're also very bullish uh, on the silver price. Um, you know, looking at where we are in the metal price cycle and the historic returns that we've seen uh, in this one time for investors to be looking at high quality names in the precious metal space and particularly in silver. Mr. Johnson, in the introduction, we alluded to the metallic group of companies. Please introduce us to them. Yeah, so this is uh, this is an opportunity that uh, has kind of come together. We uh, had metallic minerals uh, starting about two years ago, uh, silver focus, as we've talked about in the Yukon. Uh, group 10 metals, which shares uh, some common directors, um, uh, has a similar philosophy and a similar approach to business. They are focused on platinum and palladium, uh, particularly in the Stillwater district of Montana. And then our newest company to join the group, Granite Creek Copper, uh, which is a newly launched copper-focused exploration company uh, with an exciting project right next door to a high-grade copper producer in the Carmex Copper um, district of the Yukon. Um, these three companies share a common philosophy and approach to business. All three have focused on acquiring large blocks of brownfield holdings next to operating mines so that the infrastructure and facilities are already in place. All of these show multiple targets that have potential for discovery. Uh, the deposits start right at surface, which is an opportunity uh, for being able to develop them quickly and in potentially a low operating cost. And with these operating mines near next door, it really provides an opportunity to be able to fast track development uh, on these targets uh, by potentially partnering uh, with that next door operator. Or if we're successful in discovering world-class scale deposits, which we believe there's, is the potential on these properties, uh, to be able to see perhaps even the entire district become consolidated by an even larger player. Um, so it's, it's an exciting group of companies with a common philosophy, uh, and I think each one of them focused on their own uh, area of, of metal exploration uh, is worth looking at. And I think uh, we're, we're building something of, of real value here uh, for the metallic group investors going forward. Forget to ask. Well, I think that was a pretty comprehensive discussion. The one point that's probably worth uh, announcing, as I mentioned, uh, our newly launched uh, copper exploration company, Granite Creek Copper. Uh, we are just announced uh, that we're completing an initial offering. Uh, all interested accredited investors can contact us if they're uh, interested in getting additional information on that private placement opportunity. And as a reminder, Metallic Minerals trades on the TSXV symbol MMG and on the OTCQB symbol MMG. N G F. For direct inquiries, please contact Chris Ackerman at 604-629-7800, extension 1. That phone number again is 604-629-7800 at extension 1. He may also be reached at info at metallic-minerals.com. Proven and probable.com, where we interview the most respected names in the natural resource space. You may reach us at contact at provenimprobable.com. Greg Johnson of Metallic Minerals, thank you for joining us today on Proven and Probable. Thank you for joining us today on Proven and Probable. Remember to like and subscribe for more conversations with the most respected names in the natural resource space. Check out our website at www.provenandprobable.com. The information presented on Proven and Probable 
is provided for educational and informational purposes only, without any express or implied warranty of any kind, including warranties of accuracy, completeness, or fitness for any particular purpose. The information is not intended to be and does not constitute financial, investment, or trading advice, or any other advice. You should not make any financial, investment, or trading decision based on any of the information presented without first undertaking independent due diligence and consultation with a professional broker or competent financial advisor.